Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with another one of these DECA mid-price or budgie sort of opera reissues. In this case, we have Porgy and Bess. Here it is, conducted by Lauren Mazel with the Cleveland Orchestra. Now, let me say right away that the playing of the orchestra is just fabulous, and the sonics are terrific, and so is the cast. The cast features Willard White as Porgy, Leona Mitchell as Bess, McHenry Boatwright as Crown, Florence Quivar as Serena, and Barbara Hendricks as Clara, and Francois Clemens as Sportin' Life, which they spell correctly as Sporting Life. Now, this tells you that we may be dealing with a performance that is not necessarily the most, shall we say, tangy um, in its jazz-influenced idiom, and it's not. You know, Lauren Mazel's contention, remember his liner notes from the original issue was, this is an opera in the tradition of grand opera, and I'm playing it like an opera in the tradition of grand opera. Ha ha, so there. And he does, and it works perfectly well, because Porky and Bess is a grand, grand opera. It is the American Boris Godunov. It really is. I mean, when you think about it, it's just a fantastic piece of music. Unfortunately, today, opera companies are sometimes afraid to touch it because of the wokeism that contends that because Porgy and Bess was not written by African Americans, um, it must not be authentic and it has to be somehow, you know, well, you know what I mean. It's all just stupid nonsense and really unfortunate because it is one of the most beautiful and sympathetic and humane human being portraits in all of opera. And the fact that the characters happen to be African-American, that was so much part of Gershwin's intention to try and demonstrate the universality of the feelings that it expresses. And that's exactly what it does. And it's a masterpiece. Fortunately, it has a couple really fine recordings. There have been two, historically, whose supremacy has not been challenged seriously. The first was John Domaines with the Houston Grand Opera. And that is the production which is in some ways the opposite of this one. That is a real red-blooded theatrical scream fest with sound effects and everything built in. It's just marvelous. This, like I said, is a studio production, and it's a little bit more on the refined side, and it's a little bit more, oh, how would you just say it? Universalized or generalized, but it's not, you can't say that's wrong. It's certainly not wrong. Certainly not with this cast. Uh, amazing singers. Now, the other Porgy and Bessises that have come along have not been as good as either of these two, though some have had some wonderful moments. I mean, the very first one was a severely cut version on Columbia, now CBS, featuring the young Leontine Price, and it, it, you know it's sort of a, a classic of its type. Um, it was the, the sort of Broadway musical version, and it was taken on tour. She did it all in Europe and whatnot. It, it really put the work on the map. Um, so that's historically interesting, but but certainly not the complete work. Then we got then we got Simon Rattles, which again had a good cast, some good singing, but was very very I thought uninvolved and rather unidiomatic in flavor, um, much more so than this. I mean, it just it just had it had no pizzazz, in my view, and I remember very, very vividly after, you know, Gramophone and those people were screaming about how fabulous it was and they gave it a million awards in the UK and whatnot. I met a member of the cast and and I, I said, what did you think of it? And that member of the cast, who shall remain nameless, but who was a major member of the cast, it was a he, said to me, oh, he had no idea what he was doing. He was lecturing us on how to sing jazz music properly. It was just ridiculous. Ridiculous. He was obnoxious, and that was it. And well, that sort of confirmed what I thought of it, which was kind of gratifying. Then there was the Nicholas Harnacourt Borgie and Bess. Oh my goodness! I originally did the Nicholas Harnacourt Borgie and Bess as an April Fool's review, thinking it would never happen. Of course, who would hurt imagine such a thing? Then it showed up. I couldn't believe it. I was so chagrined. It's not bad. It's a very light, very, very um, elegant and uninvolving performance in many, many ways. I mean, they do do some things kind of interestingly, you know, Sommerzeit und die Leben ist einfach, 
and and es ist nicht necessarisch benutzlich so whatever i don't know i mean i'm just kidding they didn't do it in german but you kind of wish they did it would have been so much more fun anyway um that's kind of a non-starter for all that that harnacourt really loves the work. I mean, he did love the work, but his Aida was a non-starter for the same way. He just Harnan corticized everything, and, and sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. You know, you just sort of live with it. Then uh, John Marcheri did uh, a, a bridge, an abridged version that represented the performance that, that Gershwin first brought to the stage after initial tryouts, when it had to be cut down. I rule that out of court. I mean, it's not a bad performance. I understand the theory. It's a historical recreation. I don't care. I want to hear the whole damn opera. It's a fabulous opera. So if you want to hear the whole damn opera, this is a really great way to go. This and the RCA with John Domain and the Houston Grand Opera. That's it for Porky and Bess. And then you're in fabulous shape. Absolutely fabulous shape. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.